The Psychology of Criminal Conduct, 7th edition, chapter 10, Prediction and Classification of Criminal Behavior. Having described the r, &R model in the last chapter, we transition to the predictions and classification of risk and needs. The following three questions are asked. One, how well can criminal behavior be predicted? Two, what can we do with that knowledge in order to reduce the chances of criminal acts occurring? And three, to what extent do the criminal eight risk need factors apply to age, gender, and race? The prediction of criminal behavior is perhaps one of the most central activities of the criminal justice system. Predicting who will refund guides, police officers, judges, corrections, officials, and parole boards in their decision-making. Knowing that poor parenting practices lead to future delinquency directs community agencies in providing parenting prevention programs to families. As the risk principles advises, treatment programs may be most effective with moderate to high risk clients ethically being able to or unable to predict any individual's future or criminal behavior may weigh heavily upon the use of dispositions such as imprisonment and parole. In prison probation and parole systems, one of the major purposes of the risk assessment is the classification of individuals into similar subgroups in order to assign them to certain restrictions and interventions. For example, the risk for violence or escape forms part of the decision to classify inmates to maximum security prisons or the risk of reoffending is critical in assigning the frequency of contact in parole supervision. Just how correctional systems reliably separate justice involved individuals into risk groupings is part of the focus of this chapter. The various issues raised by prediction are relevant to the concerns of, of citizens as a whole because of the human, social, and economic costs of prevention are not trivial, and because the power that criminal justice professionals have over people who are arrested, detained, convicted, probated, or incarcerated is extraordinary. The issues are of immediate interest to those who become entrapped in the process of criminal justice by way of being a victim, an offender, or a criminal justice professional. Whatever our current role might be, concerned citizens, perpetrator, victim, or involved professional, we all share the interest in prediction. Thus, we all have a right to insist upon no knowledge of the following aspects of prediction. Demonstrations of the extent to which criminal behavior is predictable. The issue is predictive accuracy. Two, clear, transparent statements regarding how the predictions are made so that the information used in making predictions may be evaluated on ethical, legal, economic, and humanitarian criteria. Demonstrations of the extent to which the ways of making predictions actually facilitate criminal justice objectives and practice that predictions and the actions based on them are recorded, monitored, and explored empirically in a way that increases our understanding of crime and criminal justice. We begin with a general discussion of what is meant by predictive accuracy and some of the challenges in its measurement. Although the focus is on the technical aspects of prediction, it is not it is necessary because the discussion provides the backdrop for the topics that follow. Following the issue of predictive accuracy is a brief overview of how theory can inform the practice of risk prediction and the relevance of the principles of risk, need, and responsivity to the assessment of those involved in the criminal justice systems. Showcased will be fourth generation assessments that integrate the assessment of risk, need, and responsivity <coughs> Excuse me, with planned intervention and its wide applicability across age, race, and gender. Finally, the chapter ends with a look into the future and a summary of the obstacles of the to implementing the knowledge reviewed. 
assessing predictive accuracy. Correlation coefficients and similar statistical measures of association are valuable for research and theory. However, when it comes to everyday practical situations, more meaningful me measures of predictive accuracy are needed. Take, for example, the problem faced by a parole board that must decide whether or not to release an inmate. Many factors weigh on the minds of board members. Foremost is making a correct decision that encompasses both a safe release for the, and the denial of parole for a highly dangerous individual. In addition, there is consideration for, of the costs of making a mistake, either by releasing someone who commits another crime or denying parole to someone who is unlikely to commit another crime. Prediction is never perfect, and the parole board members in the example must decide based on a reasonable balance between a correct choice and a mistake. To add to the difficulty in decision making, the value placed on correct decisions and mistakes is usually socially defined. For example, some, for some releasing someone who commits another crime is more serious than denying parole to an inmate who does not reoffend. This very practical problem is illustrated by what researchers call the two by two prediction accuracy table. See part A of table 10.1. Inserted in each cell is the language of prediction. There are four possible outcomes. A, true positive, I am positive, he will reoffend and it turns out to be true. B, false positive, I am positive, he will reoffend, but he doesn't he doesn't. Prediction was false. C. False negative. He will not reoffend, but he does. Prediction was false. And D. True negative. He will not reoffend, and he does not. Note that cells A and D are correct predictions, and cells B and C are errors. Obviously, we want to maximize the numbers in A and D and minimize the numbers in B and C. In addition to the four outcomes that are generated from the two by two table, we can calculate the following indices of predictive accuracy. The overall proportion of correct prediction, true positives plus true negatives divided by the total number of predictions, A plus D divided by A plus B plus C plus D. The, propor the proportion of cases judged to be risk at risk that did recidivate A divided by A plus B. The proportion of cases judged not to be at risk and that did not recidivate D divided by C plus D. The proportion of recidivists correctly identified A divided by A plus C. The proportion of non-recidivists correctly identified D divided by B plus D. Part B of Table 10.1 presents real data from our research files. The risk factor was being male and the outcome measures was officially recorded reconvictions over a two-year period. The R is a moderate 0 0.15. What can be said about predictive accuracy in this case depends in part upon how we choose to report on the findings. The recidivism rate of males, the high risk cases, was five times that of females, 24% versus 4.8%. Classifying males as high risk identified 97.3% of the recidivist, 109 divided by 112. A total of 112 offenders were recon reconvicted. Of these, 109 were were males predicted to recidivate. The true negative rate was 95.2%, 59 divided by 62, in that 59 of the 62 cases that we predicted would not recidivate, did not recidivate, and thus the false negative rate was only 4.8%, 3 divided by 62. Overall, the rate, the Excuse me. However, the overall rate of correct predictions was only 32.6%. 109 plus 500 or 59 divided by 516. The tr number 5, the true positive rate was only 24%. 109 divided by 454.
And thus the false positive rate was 76%, 345 divided by 454. Here's the two by two prediction accuracy tables. And for assessing predictive accuracy, the lesson to be learned is that more information is required than any one of the above statements provides on its own. Imagine a parole board making decisions based on gender. In our example, many inmates would remain incarcerated unnecessarily and at great financial costs. For a more complete appreciation of predictive accuracy, one needs to be able to recreate the full 2x2 two two prediction table. In Part B of Table 10.1, the outstanding accuracy achieved in capturing recidivists, 97.3%, was due in large part to the fact that our risk assessment gender assigned a very large proportion of the cases to the category predicted to reoffend. That is, 88% of the cases were male, 454 divided by 516. The proportion of cases assigned to the high risk group or to the category of people we predict will reoffend is called the selective ratio, selection ratio. Because the selection ratio was high, 88% our hit rate for recidivist was high. But our hit rate for non-recidivists was low, 14.6% or 59 divided by 404. When the selection ratio is high, the false positive rate will also tend to be high, particularly when relatively few people actually do recidivate. The number of cases that do recidivate is called the base rate, which in the example was a fairly low 21.7%, 112 divided by 516. The rates of false positives, false negatives, true positives, and true negatives, as well as the magnitude of the association between the risk predictor and criminal behavior are all influenced by base rates and selection ratios in assessing the predictive accuracy of different approaches to risk assessment. Examining the two by two tables, they generate is the ideal. In practice, however, the risk assessment approach that yields the greatest number of overall correct predictions may not always be chosen. For example, one may be willing to tolerate a few more false positives in order to maximize the number of recidivists correctly identified, or there may be a situation in which it is judged more important to minimize false positives. How many false positives and false negatives there are depends on one, the accuracy of the risk measure itself, two, the selection ratio, and three, the base rate. The importance of considering the two by two tables for evaluating predictive accuracy has been emphasized, but we also know that base rates and selection ratios can influence predictive ac accuracy as measured by R. Most of this chapter deals with the accuracy of risk measures, and in chapter two, the area under the curve, AUC, was described as a measure that the, is little affected by base rates and selection ratios. Therefore, as much as possible, the AUC will be used in this chapter as the measure of risk accuracy. PCC and prediction. As described in Chapter 3, there are many theories and explanations of criminal conduct in PCC. The GPCSL perspective is championed. GPCSL pos posits the central eight risk need factors, criminal history, per-criminal attitudes, work substance misuse, and leisure recreation as more important than risk factors suggested by sociological criminology. Example, social status and forensic psychopathological criminology. Example, anxiety, poor self-esteem. The central eight are the best predictors of criminal behavior, as signi signified in the SL of the GPCSL. Criminal behavior is learned in accordance with the principles of learning. Learning is dependent upon the signaled rewards and costs for particular behavior and the strength of the behavior is dependent upon the dens on the density of rewards and costs. Therefore, GPCSL offers the following lessons for assessment. 
One, sample multiple domains of criminal conduct. Do not restrict assessment to only a few domains. GPCSL posits the, that criminal behavior is a function of the number of, and variety of rewards and costs for both criminal and non-criminal behavior. These rewards and costs arise from multiple sources and social contexts, some of which are described by the Central Aid Family Marital Pro-Criminal Associates School, Work, and Leisure Recreation at a Minimum Assess, assess the Central Aid Risk Need Factors. Two, assess the dynamic as well as the static covariates of criminal conduct. It is noteworthy that many of the predictors are dynamic or changeable social supports for crime, pro-criminal attitudes, substance misuse, etc., are predictive of recidivism and amenable to change. Static factors such as a prior criminal record may predict, but once convicted, the record is a mark that stays. Dynamic predictors have the advantage of offering an idea of what needs to be changed in order to reduce the person's risk to offend, reoffend. For example, poor use of leisure time is a predictor of recidivism. It is also dynamic and subject to change, therefore possible, possibly casual, causal. An individual with productive leisure pursuits receives rewards for prosocial behavior from others or from the activity itself. An individual without hobbies or involvement in organized pro-social activities may want to consider what can be done to promote pro-social leisure activities. Three, assessment can guide the intensity of treatment. Dynamic risk factors are the potential targets for intervention. However, the r, &R model derived from GPCSL also says that risk is directly proportional to the number of different risk factors present. That is, a high-risk person will have more risk factors. Example, criminal friends, pro-criminal attitudes, substance use, unstable, um, substance use problems, unstable employment, then a low-risk person who simply has problems in one or two risk domains. In addition, the number of and variety of risk factors reflect the density of rewards and costs for behavior. Consequently, knowledge of an individual's risk level tells us something about how much treatment is needed to reduce one's risk. Four, assessment can guide how we provide treatment. An individual's ability to learn from the environment is dependent upon a number of personal cognitive emotional factors. For example, a person's responsive, responsiveness to advice from a therapist, correctional office, or correctional worker, or family member is dependent upon cognitive ability. If the individual is of low intelligence, then providing the, the advice in a complex abstract manner will be less effective than if the advice is given in a simple concrete manner. Thus, one may choose to assess characteristics that may not be predictors of criminal behavior, but are still relevant for the delivery of services. Assessment and the principles of risk, need, and responsivity. An assessment does not need to be limited to making judgments of the risk to reoffend. <laughs> this is certainly important, but assessment can be can also be useful for guiding treatment. In chapter nine, the expanded R and R model was presented. Here, three principles that are fundamental to risk assessment: the principles of risk, need, and responsivity are revisited. Risk principle matched the level of service to the level of risk. The principle tells us who we who to treat, i.e. the higher risk offender in Andrews and Dowden's 2006 meta-analysis appropriate treatment delivered to high risk cases shows showed a modest correlation of R equals 0 0.17 with the reduced recidivism treat, treatment delivered to low risk cases had hardly any effect R equals 0 0.03. Therefore, if we are going to treat effectively, then we must have a reliable way of assessing risk up so that we can make sure it is the high risk rather than the low, lower risk who receive most of the treatment services. Need principle, target criminogenic needs. 
This principle makes a distinction between criminogenic needs, dynamic risk factors, and non-criminogenic needs. Dynamic non-risk factors. The need principle tells us what to treat. Thus, risk instruments should include assessment of criminogenic needs and the central eight reflect seven of the most relevant criminogenic needs. One of the central eight is criminal history, a static factor. From this point, the terms risk needs will be used to describe the assessment process. Responsivity, principal use, cognitive behavioral, interventions with attention to personal learning styles. The responsivity principle tells us how to treat general responsivity demands the use of cognitive behavioral techniques to influence change because they are most effective interventions to help people learn new attitudes and behaviors. Specific responsivity calls for adapting our general cognitive behavioral techniques to specific person characteristics. These characteristics range from the biological example, gender to the social example, culture, and to the phys psychological personality, emotions, and cognitive ability. It is under specific responsivity that issues concerning assessment arise. Traditional forensic assessment instru instruments that attend to cognitive and personality characteristics become important for identifying the factors that may serve as opt obstacles for addressing criminogenic needs. One cannot successfully deal with this, a substance addiction if the client is psychotic. One cannot deal with employment problems if the person is suicidal. The biological social constructs of gender and race present their own unique consideration for assessment and treatment. In order to successfully address the criminogenic needs of women, for example, parenting, victimization, experiences, and issues of financial dependence on a partner may need to be integrated into assessment and treatment. Approaches to the risk need assessment. The assessment of offenders is not a question of risk to reoffend, but also of treatment. Here, the story continues of how the assessment of justice involved persons has changed over the past 40 years. In 1996, Bonta reviewed the correctional assessment literature and described three generations of risk assessment. In the first decade of the first of the 21st century, there are four generations, Bonta 2019, Andrews Bonta, and Warmoth 2006. First generation assessment professional judgment. Here is what typically happens in a first generation assessment. A professional trained in the social sciences conducts an interview in a relatively unstructured manner. The clinician may ask some basic questions of all interviewees, but for the most part, there is a considerable flexibility in the questions asked. Sometimes psychological tests may be given, which ones are administered varies from one test administrator to another. Files may be reviewed, but what is attended to in these files is also the discretion at the discretion of the professional. At the end of the process of information gathering, the assessor makes a judgment regarding the person's risk to the community and his or her treatment needs. The key feature of the clinical approach is that the reasons for the decision are subjective, sometimes intuitive, and at times guided by gut feelings. They are not empirically validated. Professional judgments of risk by highly trained clinicians are not very accurate. The reasons for such poor performance are twofold. First, there is the problem of using informal, unobservable criteria for making decisions. Second, there is the problem of attending the two characteristics of the person that may not be empirically related to criminal behavior. Second generation assessment actuarial static risk scales. Such agreement does not happen often, but there is a consensus on this point. Actuarial assessment outperform clinical judgment in general cases of prediction. And in the prediction of criminal behavior, one of the earliest examples of the actual, actual, 
pictorial method comes from Burgess, 1928. Burgess examined more than 3,000 parolees and found 21 factors that differentiated parole successes from parole failures. <coughs> Excuse me, Burgess then gave it to every parolee one point for each factor that was present present for the parolees scoring the maximum points for the recidivism rate was 76 percent for those with the least points the rate was 1.5 percent the actorial pro approach of summer summating items perhaps because of its simplicity has been the that been the preferred choice in risk man assessment methodology Sophisticated techniques, example, multiple regressions, iterative classification have been applied to the prediction problem, but these newer techniques have shown little improvement in predictive power. Second generation assessment instruments are evidence based, but they have two major limitations. Nearly all second generation assessments have no theoretical basis and they consist mostly almost entirely of static historical items. In Table 10.2 are three examples of second generation assessment instruments. The Salient Factor Score SFS, which was widely used in the United States in the 1980s and 1990s. Hoffman, 1994, the Statistical Information of Recidivism, SIR scale, which is still used in Canada. Nuffield, 1982, and the Offender Group, Conviction Scale, OGRS, used in the United Kingdom, COPUS and Marshall, 1998, all three instruments have demonstrated satisfactory predictive accuracies with AUCs ranging from 0 0.64 to 0 0.76. And here is the examples. Apparent in the scales are the neglect of many factors theoretically relevant to criminal conduct. The example is poor criminal associates and attitudes and the predominance of items that are static and or unchangeable. On this last point, look at the SFS scale where all the items are static. Someone who is imprisoned at the age of 16 for an auto theft while high on heroin will fall into the poor category, even if this has occurred 20 years ago. And she, he has been crime free ever since. These scales give little credit to the individual who changes for the better, nor do they inform the practitioner or supervising staff as, whoops, <laughs> sorry, as to what needs to be done to reduce the per person's level of risk. Improvements for to assessment can be made with a more comprehensive assessment of the factors, both static and dynamic, that are associated the theoretically and empirically with criminal behavior. The single-minded focus on static variables and attempts to reduce more comprehensive assessment instruments to a few static items for the sake of efficiency Place limits on the utility of the assessment. The second generation scales are useful for release decisions and security and supervision classification, but the criminal justice system is also char charged with minimizing the person's risk to the community and with re reintegration, reintegrating inmates into society. To reach those these goals, dynamic factors that are theoretically informed should be applied to assessment technology. Third generation assessment risk need scales. Third generation assessments distinguish themselves by from second generation assessment in that they measure criminogenic needs. Examples of risk needs instruments are the level of service inventory revised LSIR. Andrews and Bonta, 1995, and more recently, the Post-Conviction Risk Assessment, PCARA, developed the U.S. Federal Probation and the Ohio Risk Assessment System. Given that the level of service instruments are among the most widely used and researched instruments in the world, see figures 10.1, and that the LSIR is part of the family of the level of service, LS instruments, that LSIR will serve as an illustration 
of third generation assessment. It is also the per precursor to fourth generation assessment. Level of service inventory revised. The LSIR is a theoretically based risk need assessment. The LSIR samples 54 risk and needs mostly criminogenic items, each scored in a zero one format and distributed across 10 subcomponents. Example, criminal history, education, employment, companion, substance abuse, etc. The research has ranged from examination of the psycho can psychometric properties of the LSIR, such as its reliability, convergent validity, and factor structure, to the predictive validity of the instrument. The evidence on the predictive validity of the LSIR has been summarized by Oliver ETL, 2014. The mean AUC for the prediction of general recidivism was 0 0.64, for violent recidivism was 0 0.63. It has also been a number of meta-analytic analytic comparisons of the LSIR to other risk instruments, including the SFS and the PCLR. Although making such comparison can be fraught with problems, see, for example, Williams- Wormuth, Bonta, and Citronios, 2017. The comparisons have shown the LSIR to predict as well or better than other instruments. The most important application of the LSIR, however, is informing the delivery of supervision and services to higher risk justice involved persons risk principle by identifying their criminogenic needs. The criminogenic needs and the dynamic validity of LSIR criminal needs are dynamic risk factors according to the need principle of the RNR model. If we can reduce the criminogenic needs of a client, sorry, of a client, then we can reduce the chances of future criminal behavior, Bonta 2019b. Of course, increased Criminogenic needs will be associated with the increased recidivism. A number of studies have demonstrated the dynamic nature of many of the central eight criminogenic needs. For example, changes in pro-criminal attitudes and associates, as well as employment, have been predictive of criminal behavior. To follow the need principle, the first step is to identify the criminogenic needs of the client in a reliable manner. The majority of items of the items that comprise of the LSIR are dynamic. Thus, we would expect that scores on the LSIR would change with reassessment. The change could result from naturally occurring events. The example, the client finds a job or as the result of a structured treatment. Example, community reinforcement treatment for alcohol misuse. This information could prove useful for monitoring improvement or deterioration among clients if it could be shown that changes in the LSIR scores are related to recidivism. The major results from the studies on the dynamic validity of the LSIR shown are shown in Table 10.3. There are other studies that support the dynamic validity of the LSIR, but the reporting of the results in logistic multivariate analysis does not allow the findings to be displayed in a two by two tabular form. Example, Claudia Etl, 2013. Therefore, these results are not shown in 10 point, table 10.3. The largest evaluations were, were conducted by Thomas Arnold and equals 1064, Arnold 2007, and Brenda Vos and her colleagues in equals 2849, Vos, Smith, and Cullen, 2013. The remaining studies had similar samples ranging from 55. Motia, Bonta, Andrews, 1990 to 203. Ray, Rayner, 2007. The test retest intervals were 8.6 months in Arnold's study and averaged one year in the other studies. Note that low risk cases who became worse had higher LSIR scores on retest showed higher recidivism rates and high risk cases who showed decreases scores 
demonstrated lower recidivism rates. Summary of the LSIR. The LSIR has been expanded into another third generation assessment instrument called the Level of Service Risk Need. The responsivity LS. Uh, divided by R&R, Andrews, Bonta, and Wormuth, the LSR R and R is more theoretically aligned to the central eight risk need factors. Compared to the LSIR, the instrument also adds a number of specific risk need factors. Example, sexual assault, weapon use, homelessness, victimization experiences, as well as responsivity considerations. The example, cultural and ethnic both instruments are products of a social learning perspective of criminal behavior particularly important to remember that is that changes in the LSIR scores have predicted correctional outcomes. Here is the chart and this will be the end of chapter 10 part 1. Thank you.